My name is Kevin Carey. I direct the uh, education policy program here at the New America Foundation. Um, and I just want to say thanks to all of you for braving the, braving the cold, not quite as cold as it was yesterday, but certainly unusual for Washington, D.C. to come here this morning. Um, plenty of uh, warm beverages and refreshments out there uh, to keep you going this morning. Um, we wanted to uh, start the new year with a discussion that I think is uh, both very topical and very interesting, but also resonant of a lot of the larger issues that are confronting our institutions of higher education and federal policymakers. Um, as we all know, over the last, even over the last decade, the federal government's involvement in um, and investment in higher education has grown tremendously. A uh, hundred billion dollar increase in just 10 years in combined federal grants and loan pro loans um, for a variety of reasons, um, all of which have the effect of making institutions that as a matter of purpose or, or as a matter of mission um, serve students who receive federal financial aid um, far more sensitive to the kinds of policies that we craft around those programs. Um, to the point that even what may have seemed like small changes to the parameters of a program can have outsized effects on the ability of institutions to operate financially and the choices and options that students and in this case um, parents have to make. Um, so while the topic of today's conversation um, is oriented around the Parent Plus Loan Program and uh, the set of uh, controversies and policy decisions that have swirled around that program over the last year and a half and continue to be uh, very much contended and discussed here in Washington, D.C. Um, I think the larger context for this discussion is the ongoing and continually changing um, role of the federal government um, as a financier of our higher education system uh, and the implications of that relationship for all higher education institutions, but particularly those, as I said, that serve uh, students whose income circumstances make them eligible for financial aid. Um, so I suspect that we are going to be continuing to have conversations like this in the future um, as policymakers grapple with issues of which institutions and which people and how much money and how do we balance our uh, goals for access with our uh, considerations of, uh, particularly on the loan side of things, people's ability to repay loans. And on the institutional side of things, um, how institutions can manage themselves financially given the on some level inherent regulatory uncertainty that comes with um, having your banker be the, the U.S. Department of Education. Um, we have a fantastic panel here today, some people who are tremendously knowledgeable and experienced in the field with a diverse range of perspectives on this issue. Um, so we're very grateful for them uh, for coming in and joining us in this discussion. To start things off, um, we're going to have uh, a short presentation on the Parent PLUS Loan Program that's going to be led by our senior higher education policy analyst, Ben Miller. Um, Ben's a former senior official at the U.S. Department of Education, um, very, very knowledgeable about these issues, and we'll kind of lay the groundwork for the discussion, and after that, um, our panelists will follow. So again, thank you so much for coming this morning, um, and Ben is going to start things off. Ben. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming. Uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about sort of what the Parent PLUS Loan Program is for those of you who may not be as familiar with it and sort of the changes that took place that led us to the type of discussion we're having here today. So for those who aren't familiar with them, Parent PLUS Loans are loans that go to parents of undergraduate students. And it's designed to help parents afford their children's higher education expenses. And this slide here is just a comparison of Parent PLUS loans with the Stafford loan, which is sort of the primary undergraduate loan taken out by students. And as you can see, a Parent PLUS loan is actually probably closer to a private loan than it is to a Stafford loan. Um, it carries a higher interest rate and origination fee than a Stafford loan. And it's also not eligible for the income-based payment plans that student borrowers can take advantage of to lower their payments relative to their income. Um, in addition, though, Parent PLUS loans actually can be much larger than Stafford loans. There is no stated uh, annual or maximum loan limit for Parent PLUS loans. Essentially, a parent is eligible to borrow 
anything up to the cost of their students' attendance minus any aid they've received. And so that's why you see at the bottom here, the average loan size for a parent plus loan is actually a good bit bigger than a Stafford loan. But the other thing that really sets parent plus loans apart is that it has a credit check. These are not entitlements the way that Stafford loans are. But the credit, is, credit check is actually pretty different from a typical loan product in that basically what happens is the Higher Education Act says that in order to receive a parent plus loan, you can't have an adverse credit history. So it's not really underwritten. If you don't have the advert his, adverse history, you're in for as much as you want to borrow and your terms and conditions don't change based upon the quality of your credit. But even though Congress defines what adverse credit history means, it's actually up to the Department of Education to figure out what that means through regulations. And the way the departments define it for, through regulations is sort of a two-part test. Basically that within the past five years, the parent applying for the loan can't have had any really significantly negative financial circumstances. So those are things like a default, a bankruptcy, a foreclosure, et cetera. You can see the list here. And the second is that when the credit check is run, they don't have any debts that are 90 or more days delinquent. Now, it's important to know that actually neither of these things have changed. The regulatory and the statutory requirements did not change in October 2011, sort of, which is what sparked a lot of this discussion, which I know seems odd because clearly we're here to talk about why the sort of number of loans approved has dramatically decreased. And the reason they did is because what happened was the department changed the way it actually evaluates what it means to be 90 or more days delinquent on a debt. And the way this works is when a credit check is run, each debt on your credit report can have one and only one current payment status. Uh, these are examples from TransUnion. It's one of the major credit bureaus. And you can see that basically it says you're either paying as agreed or you're in some other form of delinquency status. And so basically before October 2011, when the credit check was run, if, your credit, if you had a debt on your credit report that showed up as 90 or more days past due or one of these other uh, time-based delinquencies, you were denied the loan and couldn't receive one. But what about these bottom two categories? These aren't time-based, but they're also not sort of an indication of things going well. Essentially, a borrower can end up having their debt either charged off or um, put into collections by their creditor if it's already been delinquent for some period of time, usually more than 90 days. So what the department did was it said that we're now going to consider things that have been charged off or entered collections as also loan, or I'm sorry, debts that are more than 90 days delinquent on the grounds that they've already been past the 90 days. And so basically the number of categories that result in a denial increased. So you can see how this sort of works if pre-October 2011, let's say you had two credit cards. One, you're paying as agreed, everything's going well, and the other is in collections. Before October 2011, you would have been approved. After October 2011, you would have been denied because that account was in collections and that's now grounds for a denial. Um, just one quick side note, if you are denied a PLUS loan, there are actually a few things that can happen. First of all, if you're eligible, if you can find a qualified cosigner, you can still get a loan. Now, obviously, depending on your family's circumstances and networks, that may or may not be feasible. Second, there is a way to show that there are exceptional circumstances that should lead the department to reconsider your application. Um, this usually is something like you can show that actually the credit report's out of date and you fix the debt, or that the amount of debt you have is de minimis and really shouldn't be grounds for a denial. Um, if neither of those things sort of work, the one opportunity that students do get is they are allowed to borrow between four and $5,000 in additional Stafford debt. They're basically treated like independent students. Now, the obvious question then is, you know, why make the change? Um, we don't know sort of what the default picture looks like, and we're not entirely sure sort of um, what the results were going to be. And there's sort of been two stated rationales. Uh, the first is that when the old bank-based federal student loan system, known as the Federal Family Education Loan Program, ended, there was a desire to make sure that the transition to 100% federal direct loans conformed with all the standard industry practices. And so making sure that sort of what was being done in the direct loan program mimicked what was being done by the banks in the federal family education loan program. 
And the second part is voicing some concern that parents aren't taking out debts that they're not able to afford. Obviously, there's concerns about student debt and making sure that people aren't being overburdened. But regardless of whether or not you agree with these rationales, and I'm sure we're going to get into this later, it is indisputable that there have been some effects. Um, we've seen an increase in the, num the percentage of loans denied. Uh, it's gone from about 28% to somewhere around 38% or potentially a little bit higher. Um, and the result of this is there has been a, a fairly substantial drop in the amount borrowed in this program. Uh, about a billion dollars less was dispersed from the third quarter of 2011 to the third quarter of 2013. And that's resulted in about 207,000 fewer uh, parent recipients. We don't sort of know what the student side of this is because these are loans to parents. Um, and that at the same time that while this has affected all of higher education broadly, the biggest impacts and decreases have been seen uh, either in absolute or relative terms at for-profit colleges and historically black colleges and universities. So that's just sort of a, a brief overview of kind of what happened and how we got here. And so now I'm going to turn it over to our panel that's going to talk more about these issues, uh, in particular sort of what the PLUS loan program and these changes mean for college affordability, intergenerational borrowing, and higher education access. Thanks. Good morning. Um, I'm Libby Nelson. I'm an education reporter with Politico, and I'm here with this very experienced and interesting panel um, to moderate today. And I really want to jump pretty much from that straight into the discussion, but I know you all have handouts. I will tell you very briefly who everybody is um, anyway, or let you introduce yourselves and, and talk for just a minute about what, what it is that you do. Cheryl, do you want to get started? Uh, sure. Um so I'm a senior vice president for uh, public policy and government relations at UNCF. Uh, thank you very much to New America Foundation for hosting the forum, and good to see so many folks here who are interested in this topic. Um, just very briefly on UNCF, we, uh, our mission is to help minority students go to and through college. Uh, we've been working at this for nearly 70 years. Uh, most people know us by our motto, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, last year, we uh, launched a new PSA campaign updating that to a mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Uh, we've raised over $3.6 for student scholarships. Um, uh, we awarded 10,000 scholarships under 400 uh, programs each year uh, to minority students at more than 900 colleges and universities across the country. Uh, we also uh, support and raise money for uh, historically black colleges and universities, uh, and we advocate on behalf of them, uh, in particular 37 private historically black colleges and universities. Uh, and as Ben said, uh, the HBCU community has been very concerned about the changes in the Parent PLUS loan program. Uh, and we can talk further about the impact on uh, our sector and our thoughts about uh, the Parent PLUS loan changes. Wonderful. Thank you. Steve? Well, I'm Steve Gunderson, President and CEO of the Association of Private Sector Colleges and Universities, which is a fancy name for the career colleges. Uh, and I'm here because David Bergeron didn't want to be up here at the table. He <laughs> understands this stuff and I don't. Um, but um, <clears throat> obviously, and in, in, in you look at, at Ben's presentation, you, you get a pretty quick understanding because the, uh, the historically black colleges and the private sector career colleges are the ones that are most impacted. And, and that's obvious because that's the constituencies we serve. They tend to be low income. They tend to be first generation post-secondary education. They obviously have the economic challenges that are impacted not only by PLUS, but I think by a whole series of other loans as well. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. My name is Kevin Fudge. I'm here from American Student Assistance, which is an educational debt management organization based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I guess one could say the capital of higher education in this country, uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> and cold. And cold, right. Uh, so 
It's interesting, yeah. the perspectives we have here. Uh, ASA is an organization that's dedicated to helping students and families be successful in their student loan repayment. Along those lines is uh, education about what it means to be a wise borrower, so not overborrowing, um, and then understanding your options when you do take out loans, what those repayment options are, uh, and noticing that there's a great difference between uh, Parent PLUS loans and undergraduate Stafford loans. Uh, well, we can talk about that more about that later. Um, but basically, um, we're pleased to be here, and our focus is on what's in the best interest of the borrower um, and how do we advance those interests going forward. And Rachel, I'm going to ask you not only to introduce yourself, but to give a little bit of an idea of the conclusions you reached in the report you're releasing today um, to sort of get us started into the discussion as well. Great, thanks. Um, so my name is Rachel Fishman. I'm a policy analyst with the Education Policy Program here at N the New America Foundation. Um, I do a lot of research uh, surrounding policies of financial aid and access and success of students, especially disadvantaged students. Um, and so starting about a year ago, I did a lot of research into the Parent PLUS loan program. I heard rumblings from financial aid counselors that students were getting rejected at a higher rate. And I'd always been curious about that program. And so I started uh, researching it more and I uncovered that a lot of low income, moderate income students had started borrowing these loans. And, you know, is it good public policy to have disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged families taking on debt, that they're putting the parents so much into debt after the student has already gone into debt um, for a college education? And, and so, without a doubt, as, as I was reading all these anecdotes and hearing from HBCUs and from students, the implementation um, of the credit change was totally bungled. Um, it left students scrambling in the middle of their academic careers uh, with trying to find the funds to remain in school, and that never should have happened. But the underlying motivation of the department was, was strong. Uh, we shouldn't be lending money to parents who can't afford to pay that money back. These loans are inflexible. Remember, they're not dischargeable in bankruptcy. They're also on top of loans and grants and aid that is already available to students. Um, so basically, doing this research, I, I've come up with a recommendation, uh, three recommendations. I call it a choose your own adven adventure for <laughs> policymakers. One would be to add an ability to repay um, to the credit check criteria. So not just looking at adverse credit, but sort of a forward-looking credit check that takes into account uh, a family's resources, a parent's resources to repay the loan. Um, and that's something that, that uh, I know the HBCUs have, have been behind adding an ability to pay uh, metric. Um, another thing that they could do, that policymakers could do, would be to cap the loan. Um, so not to make it unlimited up to cost of attendance, but maybe cap it depending on a student's expected family contribution. So for example, if the expected family contribution of a student um, is zero, as determined by the FAFSA, then they shouldn't be able to get a loan because uh, the federal government is telling them you do not have any money that you can put towards your education. Um, and so the last thing I would recommend would be uh, that you could choose would be to eliminate the program entirely and increase um, student loan limits to kind of account for the money that would be lost uh, for those smaller uh, Parent PLUS loans. Um, some of my smaller recommendations, so if you were to retain the program, I say that we need better data, and this is true for everything related to education, not just loans, but PLUS loans are, are really problematic, and we just don't have any data on them. So we don't know, um, for example, how many people are defaulting, at what institutions. Um, and, and so it's hard to sort of diagnose a problem with the program. We know that there are low-income students borrowing and that that's probably a bad idea, but we don't know if they're defaulting at any higher of a rate, and we really need to know that. Um, and also not to package PLUS loans and financial aid packages, allowing students to just max out on PLUS loans up to the full cost of attendance without thinking about budget and how they should appropriately limit these loans given that they're a very inflexible form of debt. So before we get into all of those recommendations, which should give us plenty to discuss, is this microphone working? Yes. Okay, cool, great. Um, I want to ask a little bit um, how your constituencies or the colleges you represent, um, and Kevin, the students you work with, how you see them using PLUS loans, um, what sort of needs they fill, and when you think it's appropriate for a student to take out or perhaps not to take out a PLUS loan. Um, so Cheryl, I don't know if you want to start with the HBCUs and sort of what you see is the, the role these loans play? 
Sure. So um, a, a couple points that I'd like to make about HBCUs. Um, uh, our institutions, and, and here I'll talk more broadly, not just private, but also public, um, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, you know, as, as many of you know, uh, the mission of our institutions is and has been for over 150 years to enroll um, low-income disadvantaged students, primarily <coughs> African-American students, and help them get to the finish line in terms of earning a college degree. Uh, HBCUs have been particularly impacted by PLUS loans, I think, because uh, we have a high prevalence of uh, low-income students at our institutions. Our, our average um, percent enrollment of Pell-eligible students is about 74 percent across all HBCUs. That is substantially higher than the average for all public colleges uh, and universities, which is about 43 percent. Uh, so we are very, our institutions are very, very focused on this population and helping them succeed. Um, we think PLUS loans are a critical piece of the financing package uh, to help these students succeed. Um, many of them do need that extra support to help meet the cost of attendance uh, at, at uh, some of our colleges and, and universities. Um, we think the, the Parent PLUS loan program is not a perfect program. Uh, and certainly can be improved, but we think it is a, a substantial uh, component, you know, to financial aid for, for our students. I mean, I, I think one um, positive thing about New America Foundation pulling this report together and holding this forum is uh, we want to focus on uh, what we think is the real conversation, and that is how do we, uh, as a country, uh, help low-income students succeed and finance their college education? in today's economy when we know that it's essential to, to, get, a, to, get, to get a degree. Um, and if not plus loans, then we need to look at how do we boost Pell Grants. Uh, Pell Grants uh, is the foundational program for college assistance for low-income students. Uh, Pell Grants pay only 30% now of the um, average cost of attendance at a public institution, even less at a private institution. Um, so for our population, um, loans are a necessary fact of life, and we need to figure out how we can um, provide the assistance that they need uh, so that they are able to manage um, that loan debt well um, and uh, look at PLUS loans in the, con the broader context of, of uh, how we finance student financial aid for this population of students. Steve, how do, how do students at um, for-profit colleges and universities use PLUS loans, and what role do they play at your institutions? I think everybody has been a little surprised as they started looking at the data, including us, as the percentages that we see on the PLUS program with uh, Rachel study and, and others, because we've always had this image that our schools are all adults coming back to school for career education and career skills. The reality is about 31% of our students are under the age of 24, so they would be about uh, the ones who would be dependent. Um, when you look at that, um, excuse me, that's 37 percent, not 31 percent, um, and when you look at that, you'll also see in our demographics that 51 percent of our students come from families where the highest level of education attainment for their parents was high school or less. So you are dealing with a very different economic demographic. And the reality is, because we're proprietary schools, um, there is no operational subsidy. So tuition and fees cover the cost of the design and delivery of that education. And when you look at, as, as Cheryl said, that the Pell is really not keeping up with low-income students' needs in terms of cost of education today, uh, they have to look at other options. And, and clearly, private loans is, uh, should I say, been the, the uh, discouraged term, <laughs> if, if we can put it affectionately. So, so you look at how do you put all this together? And, you know, I've, I've been in our schools for, I've been at AFSCU for two years on February 1st. There have been 75 different schools. And, I mean, when you visit those schools, you begin to appreciate, should I say, the economic opportunity that these schools present for them. Um, literally, um, I was in a school just before Christmas where they collected neckties 
to give to the young men to go out and do job interviews. I mean, let, let's understand the economic environment in which we're dealing here. So there is not free money sitting around at home that is going to do this. And, and what really bothers me about this, and, and it's not what we should or should not do with PLUS, but I don't think we can or we should deal with PLUS in isolation. We've got a much bigger question here, and that is how are we going to address the issue of access and affordability for low-income students at an era when 65 to 85 percent of all jobs require some level of post-secondary education. And if we don't collectively deal with that conversation as we get into reauthorization, we fail the very constituencies we're trying to help. Kevin, what about um, students themselves when they're looking at their financing options? What makes them turn to a PLUS loan and, and what might make it a, a wise or a poor decision on their part? Uh, thanks for your question. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to mention, um, address your po point about access. And I, part of the issue with access is I, the definition of access should be expanded to include once the debt is repaid. If you're just defining access as the person has a $30,000 PLUS loan, they're allowed to enroll. Uh, I, I'm, I would argue that that's not necessarily access. Um, access is when the debt is satisfied, the loan is repaid, and then the person is actually able to act on the, the investment and then you know, move forward successfully through their career. Um, one of the things that we uh, like to emphasize is our choices. And I mentioned that Boston, sort of the cradle of liberty, the cradle of higher education, we have the privilege of having um, uh, a wide range of brand name schools, highly competitive institutions that many people want to attend. Um, but along those lines, those are also the most, some of the most expensive schools in the country. And actually, in New England, we have the highest concentration of schools, private institutions that are uh, you know, $40,000, $50,000 and above, um, as well as in the top five of the most public, uh, I'm sorry, the most expensive public universities in the country. So I, I think what we try to do is explain what people, that you have options when it comes to borrowing and then repaying, or when it comes to deciding where you're going to go to school. Um, if the institution's interests are to enroll as many students as possible so that they meet their goals, their interest isn't necessarily, is this affordable for the student or not? And if you look at us as, or I, I tend to look at myself as sort of like a loan doctor or a loan whisperer, um, you know, and, and I do a lot of work after the fact when people have already borrowed, um, I would like to do much more preventative medicine and preventative care in saying, you know, let's take a look at your finances, let's take a look at this picture, is this feasible or not? And if the, you know, you want to take the doctor analogy further and say first do no harm, you know, I, I agree with all the rosy projections and the scenarios and, and trying to create more policies that will help in the long term, but if we focus on what's happening right now, right now, families, the students that I deal with are taking out more than they can reasonably expect to repay, and the schools aren't going to tell them not to do that because their interests are, we need as many seats as to many students in seats as possible to meet our enrollment objectives. You know, the, uh, some schools are, I, and I, I don't want to paint a broad brush and say that they're not necessarily um, have the students' interests at heart, but higher education is a business. You know, it's not charity. So uh, it, the students that I work with, in fact, I saw a young woman on Monday um, who came in because she wasn't able to afford the next semester. She was carrying a previous balance. Um, for, of $8,000 from the prior semester, and she couldn't enroll, and because she couldn't enroll and, and address and take classes for the spring semester, her financial aid was subsequently dropped. So now she doesn't have any grants or loans for the upcoming semester, and she can't pay the previous semester. So she's kind of in a rock and hard place. She's like, well, can you help me find some scholarships? Mm, January 6th, looking for a scholarship for January 22nd, it's probably not gonna happen. Um, and, you know, the parents, now, now that I'm a parent, with seven, I have a seven and four year old at home, we play lightsabers all the time, um, I completely understand the idea of you want your, your student to realize their academic, social, human potential. And so you want to do every, anything to help them go to the college of their <coughs> dreams, the college of their choice. Uh, at the same time, you have to be realistic about what are, you, what, are, what, are, what are the long-term consequences of this decision? And now, as I'm trying to think about, as me and my wife sit down and think about, if UMass right now, UMass Amherst, the flagship campus is r roughly $25,000 a year. So when my first grader graduates from co uh, high school, I'm guessing it'll be roughly, what, 40? So we're already talking about trying to invest now. And we actually, I, I came up with this great solution. I'm like, oh, well, home college. You know, people homeschool. <laughs> I'm like, well, home college, you know? I'm like, it's brilliant. Anyway, I'm going to trademark that, by the way. But um, the point is that 
when, it, when PLUS is packaged as part of financial aid, I don't think students really understand and families understand what that implication, what that really means. That that's their responsibility, that that's unsecured debt, right? And so if we start with the basics of honest financial aid packaging, of having a debt to income ratio assessment uh, and a realistic uh, uh, judgment of whether or not a family can theoretically afford to repay, we can talk about, well, you have options. You don't necessarily have to go to that particular school. If, if you're Pell eligible, you can go to the community college down the street, and as long as you maintain a 2.5 GPA, have automatic acceptance to any one of the state four-year colleges or universities, um, and a lot of uh, states have that type of agreement. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's talking about policy in the long term, but it's also looking at what's happening right now and, and being able to address those, those issues. Do either of you have a, a response to anything in those statements you'd like to make before we move along? Well, I, I would totally agree with um, the fact that we need to provide more meaningful information to, to students about uh, their financial aid packages and their obligations. You know, we're looking at the PLUS loan program, also trying to get ready for reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, if that ever occurs. Uh, you know, and we think that this is a program that needs tweaking along a number of fronts, you know, including um, the financial literacy. Uh, this is a program that doesn't really have a financial literacy um, component to parents. And, you know, we're, you might think, well, parents, do they really need that? I mean, even highly educated people get confused about student financial aid terms. I was talking to my brother-in-law, whose uh, daughter is um, a student at University of California in Davis. Uh, and he was confused about what's a direct loan versus a Stafford loan. What's a parent plus loan? Um, who, you know, whose obligation is it to pay? So uh, I think even highly educated people need uh, some form of literacy counsel counseling. I think we'd like to see uh, as part of plus loan uh, 2.0 uh, some thought given to how that might be incorporated into, into the program, uh, particularly for, um, you know, less educated uh, parents who want to invest in their, their kids' education. Uh, you know, I think we need uh, to think about how we provide that kind of intensive um, counseling. Um, if, if I have any response, it's just, I get really frustrated when we talk about this issue and we say that all we're going to do is make sure that the only people who get loans are the people who have guaranteed ability to pay. I mean. I grew up in an era when post-secondary, all of education was considered an investment in the future, and of course there's some risk. I mean, I've got to tell you, if my parents, middle class, rural Wisconsin folks who had four kids in college at once had been told, you've got a guarantee that you can pay off all of the loans, I probably wouldn't have got to go to school. So we start with that, and, and part of the problem here in this whole discussion is we're all saying we're going to put all the pressure on that family or that student to prove their fiscal integrity. Well, what about the government. I mean, the reality is that the projections are the Federal Department of Education had a profit of $41.3 billion on the Stafford, the PLUS graduate, and the PLUS parent programs last year. CBO projects that over the next decade they will have a profit of $175 billion on these three programs. You saw in, in Ben's presentation what the origination fee and what the loan rates were going to be for the PLUS program. So before we point fingers at everybody else, I think the government, the Department of Education has some responsibility in this conversation as well. Well, I don't know if it's pointing fingers, and I would just say that, Steve, when you went to school, uh, I, I'm guessing it was a little bit cheaper than it was today. Oh, sure. I mean, the states have withdrawn their support. That's no question about it. Right. So, Absolutely. I mean, it's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison and saying, you know, what a student received in a grant or loan 30 years ago is the equivalent of what it is today. So, so let's, let's just talk about it from a business perspective, right? Um, if minority serving institutions, uh, it's, the evidence would show that perhaps their endowments aren't as large as other institutions. And p perhaps maybe that would be why uh, they rely on plus loans to a disproportional percentage than other institutions. Um, if we just look at this from a, from a business perspective, 
if the goal of any institution would be to have strong, supportive alumni who contribute to the institution because they believe in the mission, they believe in the value of their investment, they want to see other people benefit from it going forward, then it would behoove the institutions not to saddle those potential graduates with debt because the evidence and common sense has shown that students with high levels of debt are less likely to donate to their institutions from which they graduated. So that it's part of, it, it all, it's all part of the, um, the challenge or the problem. And it's not something that's simply financial literacy and saying, I, I agree with you, Cheryl, because there are people I see on a daily basis, highly educated, who are unaware about the difference between grants and loans. When I give presentations, I say, what's the principal difference between a grant and loan? Silence. You know, tumbleweed rolls by sometimes, you know? And then finally, someone will be like, grants are free? I'm like, yes, grants are free money. And then they're like, loans you have to pay back? Yes, loans you have to pay back. And loans you have to pay back if you're, in, and I ask the question, do you have to pay back the loan if you don't complete the program? Half the people say yes, half the people say no. Do you have to pay the loan back if you're not satisfied? Not a, you could graduate and not, and, and not be satisfied with the quality of education or the college experience, and you still have to pay, and there's some confusion about that. So it, it, you can have financial literacy, but the, the issue is these are real dollars that we're talking about, and when, if you talk, I'm not suggesting that you tie the plus and say you can only take out a loan if you can pay it back, but there's a huge, issue with giving somebody a loan that exceeds their income. Like, if you're giving somebody a $30,000 loan and they make $20,000 a year, and they're a parent and their income is pretty much capped, potentially, I'm, I'm not, I don't understand how that makes sense. You know, at least with, with students and income-based repayment, you're, 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 it's a different, uh, investment in that you're saying you're betting on the student to be able to increase his or her income over time and utilize income-based repayment to therefore provide students some financial relief until their income gets up to speed with being able to satisfy the, the loan that they already borrowed. With parents, it's a completely different story. Well, I, I don't think you and I disagree. Um, the reality is when and if we ever get to reauthorization, I think there's a growing consensus. I mean, every white paper I've seen from everyone says that we have to redirect more of our financial aid programs into financial aid for low-income students. I mean, I think every higher education association says you start with that. I think most, certainly we do, suggest that we ha have to have simplicity in the loan programs and grant programs because it is too confusing. We actually support one grant, one loan program. So we can move in that direction. So I think there are a number of things like that that can be done. But what I'm saying, and I said in my opening remarks, is you can't just deal with plus in isolation. What you've got to do is deal with the issues of access, affordability, and uh, all of the other accountability issues that, that fit into this. And how do we design and deliver a policy that engages in opportunity for low-income students. I mean, I, I look at one of the things that's happening, and, and if you look at Rachel's numbers, and, and I agree with most of the numbers in her report, there was one number there where she said we have 6% of the students and 17% of the PLUS loans. We don't think that was an accurate number because everything we've seen says we have 13 to 14% of the post-secondary students, so the 17% would be absolutely about right, okay? But if you look at all of the other numbers there, I think there is a recognition that all of us need to step back and figure out how are we going to fund access moving forward. Rachel, did you have a point you wanted to jump in with? Well, there's a, there's a couple things that have been going on here, and I think Kevin touched on a point uh, really well. So there, there's a reason why student loans exist, right, for students, because it's to build their human capital. It's, the government is investing in a student because we know it's going to pay both individual and societal dividends. So mm -hmm. we can't really talk about Parent PLUS loans in isolation at all because students have available to them 
Stafford loans, both unsubsidized, unsubsidized and subsidized, and if they're rejected for a PLUS loan, they then have access to four to $5,000 more per year. And that loan money is um, you know, maybe on top of a Pell Grant, so you're really starting to hit upon college costs. Um, so you can't deal with uh, you know, PLUS loans in isolation, nor can you deal with college costs in isolation. So we're talking about how can we provide more access? How can the federal government reform its programs so that it's providing larger grants to students, which we know are better targeted? But I mean, how are your institutions um, going to address college costs is, is sort of what I'm trying to get at as well, because that can't help happen in isolation either. The federal government can't keep throwing um, money at higher education and higher education institutions basically be let off the hook to increase their tuitions to let states off the hook to disinvest from their institutions. I totally agree we shouldn't let states off the hook uh, in terms of their investment in public higher education. Um, with regard to private higher education, uh, uh, our 37 HBCUs are private institutions. And they don't get state support. Uh, and, you know, they, are, they have to support their operations through tuition and fee revenues, um, which largely come through student financial aid. Uh, I think if you would go to most um, of the HBCU campuses, uh, you're going to see places um, that are very serious about learning um, and very serious, uh, very serious about uh, college affordability. Uh, we are, we are uh, educating a very disadvantaged population. Uh, so our, our presidents are, is, are extremely sensitive to the fact that they need to keep their costs down. Uh, our private institution's uh, cost of attendance is roughly 30% less uh, than the average of other pri uh, private uh, institutions across the country. Um, it's, it is, uh, I think when we talk about college costs, we also should understand that uh, it is expensive to run colleges. Uh, colleges need to meet accreditation standards. Our, our college campuses, many over 150 years old, do you know what it costs to renovate a building uh, to make it up to date with 21st century technology? Uh, so, there, so there are costs, I think. Um, uh, we shouldn't uh, think that our institutions are just willy-nilly uh, raising costs. Uh, I think uh, they are this, this issue of affordabil affordability is foremost uh, in their minds. Um, you know, and I just go back to the point that we're all making, and that is, you know, we need a larger investment in need-based aid, which um, uh, the federal government and many states have gotten away from. Uh, we spend more in tax-based assistance uh, through uh, tax credits than we, uh, on an annual basis than we spend on the Pell Grant program. Uh, so we've got to look, uh, take a hard look at uh, raising need-based aid. Uh, Low-income students today um, uh, take out a, a percentage of uh, rely on student loans more than twice uh, as much as other students. Uh, and they still have unmet need. I mean, that's why the PLUS loan program is, we think, a critical part of the overall financing package. Uh, so these are hugely complex issues. Uh, I think we also have to think about, do we want a higher education system that includes choice for students? Uh, lower cost community colleges are going to be an option for some students. Uh, I think there's research increasingly suggesting that if we want to keep an eye on college completion, um, going to a community college and working uh, may not be the best solution for many low-income students. Uh, life gets in the way. Uh, so um, we need to think about are we going to consign low-income students to low-cost institutions or are we going to keep other options open for them that might be a better fit. It might be a better fit, but it's not affordable, and that's incontrovertible. Like, the, the facts are the facts. Like, is it fair? No. I, I mean, I'm not, it's, it's, it's not, I'm not, I don't, I don't say this with pleasure, with glee, like maniacally, you know, rubbing my hands together like Montgomery Burns and The Simpsons. Like, I, I'm, it's unfortunate. But if, if, if we're talking about the, the best interests of the students, and, and the borrowers, first of all, the reason why PLUS exists in isolation is because it's not included 
in the cohort default rate, and we don't have as robust data on PLUS as we do for the other components of the federal loan programs. So that's why it's in isolation. So I would argue to let's, let's have some transparency and see what the numbers actually are. I mean, we can extrapolate. We can use anecdotal evidence, and we can attempt to make that statistically significant. You know, or we can actually get the data and see what we're talking about so that we can all be a part of the solution, right? But the, the facts are the facts. And if, if I mean, the, 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 the letter in Rachel's report, I sat down with that family. You, politicians often talk, often talk about kitchen table, kitchen table issues. I was at this family's kitchen table sitting with this student whose sole desire was to go to Morehouse and become a Morehouse man in Atlanta, Georgia. His mother works at Verizon, makes $40,000 a year. In his financial aid package was a plus loan in excess of $30,000. So I had to sit with that family and be the bearer of, and not, not bearer of bad news, because no one wants to have the discussion. It's a difficult conversation to have. You know, the parent, the first generation student, the parent's excited. You got into a four year college, because you, you talk about consigning students to two year colleges. I'll tell you what happens in Massachusetts. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, because, because we have these brand name schools, they get overlooked. In graduate school, I was graduate school with Zakia Smith, member of the audience, Luna Foundation, way to go, Zakia, right? We had students who started at Los Angeles Community College, second largest city in the country, eight million people, transferred to UCLA, then went to Harvard Graduate School of Education. Now that student is at Columbia finishing up a PhD. Another student went to UC, or I'm sorry, uh, Glendale Community College and went to UC Davis and then transferred. So, it's not, it's not consigning students to a particular path. It's looking at what's viable. And you know, I, I talk to parents who say that community college isn't real college. They have a grant to go to school for free and get a Pell Grant refund, but they don't go because that's not real college. Or my son should go to a, a four-year institution. And the, the headmasters of, a headmaster of a high school that we work with is like, you know, no, we're, we're, they're under pressure because they're trying to get kids to, you know, into four-year schools so that it looks better for their, what, the, what they're being measured on, their metrics. But what's being lost in all this is what is the cost, at what cost? Always ask yourself at what cost? So yes, give students a choice, give them an option. But it, is, it doesn't really make sense to have a student whose mother, single mother, makes $40,000 a year, take out a $30,000 plus loan for that first year. That's one year. How many years does it take to get a bachelor's degree? Right? Four, if you're lucky, if you're on the five-year, six-year plan, right? Okay? So in theory, she could have a, uh, over $100,000 in, in plus loan debt. And in fact, I'm actually working with a young woman, a um, um, young woman, I say everybody's young, she's in her 50s. <laughs> I, I'd say that to be polite, but she's a parent who's, um, she has $120,000 in plus loans right now. So, so you know, I, I understand, I get the rosy scenarios, technology, infrastructure, costs, they, they, they are what they are, I agree. But if you break it down to the lowest common denominator and say, do, what, is a, what is in this student's best interest? And you, and you take that, and then you, have, you start to have your conversation. I think that's a much different perspective than, you know, let's talk about the states investing and, you know, increasing Pell. Sure, that, that would be great, if, but what is happening right now? And boots on the ground, people are facing financial hardship because of an attempt to take out an investment. And the thing, point that we haven't touched on yet is how PLUS can lead to multi-generational debt. So if we're talking about like human capital and the, the, the evidence is out there how certain communities have issues with wealth management over time and you know, we could, we could, that's a whole other conversation for another day, right? But a young woman who I helped a couple years ago try to go to Spelman, her, mother, her grandfather took out a private loan, her aunt took out a loan, her parents took out a loan, okay? She took out loans. She could no longer afford to go to school so now she's working at the Boston Aquarium. And we don't really measure student, we, we measure debt from students who graduate, right? What about the students who don't graduate and who have debt? Are, are they better off because they attempted to go to a school that was, they couldn't afford and they went for a couple of years and they dropped out and now you have debt and no degree? Like how, how is that in the best interest of students? I want to take off of that point, actually, and ask another, and we could get back to this. I'm, I'm sure we will get back to this, um, but ask a sort of a more specific question, which is, 
we're talking about not dealing with plus, plus loans in isolation and in dealing with this during reauthorization. The department is preparing to deal with plus loans um, in isolation. They have a rulemaking session coming up on plus loan lending criteria. I'm sorry to say the word rulemaking. I know some of us have sat through too much of that um, already. So they are, regardless of what people would prefer, they are preparing to take on this issue uh, in kind of a singular way. And so I want to ask, do you think the program needs changes? Um, lending criteria, you know, is, you don't have to say, you know, three years or five years or, or seven years on the credit history, but should a plus loan be an entitlement like a student loan or should there be people who cannot take out a plus loan? I would say that there should be people who should not be taking out a plus loan and those are families that are not making enough money like when you you know I, I ran some numbers on on NIPSAS data and and I saw that um, there are Pell Grant students and so we're talking about students who mostly come from families making less than $40,000 um, who are taking out plus loan debt and and that concerns me and it should it should really concern the federal government too because we want to make sure that the federal government is not put in a position of lending money to uh, parents who are unable to pay them back um, and we don't want to put parents in that position either. You know, I, I read um, this morning in the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, had an article about this event and they featured a parent who basically said she's financially ruined from taking on this loan, but that her son had graduated and she's like, you know what, I would financially ruin myself all over again um, if that were, you know, because he did graduate and, and, you know, his life is going to be better for it. But that really puts the federal government in a terrible position. They should not be allowing parents to do that. So I think something must be done. I think um, the only thing they really could do was change the adverse uh, credit history, as ben, ben explained. But adverse credit history doesn't do a really good job. So maybe you have an adver uh, so maybe something's going on with your adverse credit history, but as it turns out, you do have the resources to pay the loans back. Um, you know, that should be taken into account. We want to make sure that if we are going to be lending parents money, that they do have the ability to repay the loans. Uh, just, a, just a couple comments. One is about sort of intergenerational effects. Um, and uh, again, I, we, we don't want parents to take on more debt uh, than they can, um, they can manage. Um, on the other hand, you know, college is a significant investment that has intergenerational effects. Uh, and, um, you know, for low income Americans in particular, you know, that is the pathway for them their kids uh, to the middle class. Uh, so I think we also have to look at that kind of intergenerational effect when we start uh, discussing student loan, um, student loan issues. Um, I think there's one thing that we probably could all agree on, and, and I'm hoping that uh, we will get a, a, uh, a bigger window into the Parent PLUS loan program uh, during rulemaking, and that is this is a program we don't know very much about. Uh, we do need more transparency. We need more data, um, more information. Uh, the Department of Education now is the sole uh, administrator of this program. The Department of Education issues the loans, uh, collects the data, uh, and we know very, very little um, about this program. So, you know, we can all kind of mention our anecdotes, but I think the department would do us all a great service if it, per, it put out more information about who's borrowing, um, income characteristics, uh, what's happening with default rates. Uh, there's a whole host of questions around this program that I think um, more information would help inform not only the rulemaking, but the policy making on this program. I, I just want to go back to what I said at the beginning, that I think if we deal with plus in isolation, we do a disservice to everything in that we don't create a solution. So I, I want to start with that premise. But that being said, do I think there are changes that can be made plus? Absolutely. I think that there's no question that the issues of transparency and financial literacy are essential here. And I think that we ought to be separating uh, the aid awards for the student and the plus loan. I totally agree with that. We, uh, as, as you mentioned, Rachel, I, I think the adverse credit issue has to be dealt with. And I think also that uh, we can cap parent loans at, at, at an appropriate level now. We happen to believe that uh, the colleges ought to have some campus-based authority in determining what those caps are, whether it be on this loan program or any other loan program. I mean, 
I don't believe in 2014 that the federal government can sit there and say one size fits all for all students, all schools, all parts of the country, and I really worry that we're getting way too much into that one system when we really need to have the flexibility of discretion by those campuses in dealing with those situations. Obviously, it has to be open, it has to be transparent, it has to be fully understood, um, you know, all of those kind of things. But Well, I, uh, co colleges do have professional judgment um, financial administrators do and have some limited flexibility. Not in the loan programs. Correct. It, but that goes, if you talk about the federal methodology doesn't allow for tons of things like cost yeah. of attendance, you know, debt already incurred from students in college. So those, that's a potential solution as well. Uh, but the first thing is just to start with the data is to get a scope, an accurate scope of the, of what we're talking about here. So it's not strictly, I agree, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the anecdotal evidence is statistically significant, and if I could do that, I'd be a PhD in stats. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm all for that, and seeing more data, and having a cap. I mean, I, I, that's a reasonable um, discussion if we're talking about loan limits for undergraduate students, and there's no loan limit for plus. Like, that's just is not a sound policy or common sense. Um, so. This is what I get for asking a multi-part question. Um, I'm going to ask a yes or no question. Should there be underwriting criteria for PLUS loans, in your opinion? Uh, if we're going to allow parents to uh, borrow up to the cost of attendance, uh, which, I, which is the current case and I think probably should remain, I think it's reasonable to have underwriting criteria. Um, you know, the, the difficult question is, you know, what makes sense? Uh, so that um, uh, the government's interests are protected, um, but parents and, fa and children's interests are protected. Um, you know, and so that's, that's not an easy question. Uh, I think the current underwriting uh, criteria are too narrow. Uh, you know, as Ben's presenta presentation indicated, relying uh, primarily on a backward-looking uh, credit history check. Uh, we probably do need more, uh, you know, flexibility. The, the department needs more flexibility to look at um, current financial circumstances of, of parents um, and, and, and expected financial circumstances. You know, that flexibility is not in the current, uh, the current regulation. Uh, you know, I'd like to see the department do some work and be transparent in um, you know, validating, um, you know, what, what criteria um, help predict uh, a parent's ability to repay a loan or not repay a loan. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work, I think, to be done here on what the right underwriting standards are, you know, so that we can maintain access to college for low-income students. Uh, you know, also, I think just philosophically, um, for low-income students, uh, in particular, because that's the frame that, that we're focused on, uh, this program, you know, should be looked at um, as a, a, a method to provide capital to families who may not be able to get capital in the, the private uh, uh, sector. I mean, that's, that's a, um, a premise that's undergo undergirding, undergirding our student uh, loans, the Stafford Loan Program. Um, this is a program that um, uh, Steve mentioned uh, is profitable for the government. Um, you know, there, uh, this, is the, the, this is a program that uh, over the lifetime of, the, of Parent PLUS loans, uh, the government recoups 99% of uh, loan pro proceeds. Uh, so I think we have to think about um, whether it's appropriate for the government to undertake some risk uh, to finance capital for low-income students. Uh, that's probably offset in this program by providing capital to more well-off parents who are uh, paying down their, their loans timely. Um, and, you know, figuring out what the right balance is. I don't think we have that right balance now. Steve? Is, I think Cheryl did it much more eloquently than I could. Um, I would just say underwriting standards Sure, but the devil is in the details.
So one of the suggestions Rachel made in her paper was ending the program entirely. Um, and again, understanding that you don't necessarily want to deal with these issues in isolation. If that were to be done in isolation, um, what, what effect would that have on students? And what, what do you think the outcomes would be? We know that there are, um, I think, almost a million parents across the country that are taking out Parent PLUS loans, so, um, you know, both middle income and low income uh, families. So I think if we were go going to end the program, that would have very significant um, impacts uh, on college access all across the country, both for middle class families and, and others. Um, we saw, as Ben said, just with a tightening of the credit criteria, <coughs> um, you know, that resulted in a loss of $1.2 billion across the country in student aid uh, available to, to students for college access. Um, so uh, I think if we were to end, if policymakers were to end this program, we have to give some very serious thought uh, to what should replace it. Uh, uh, and looking at Pell Grants and Stafford loans, um, and, and, other, um, and, and other possibilities, uh, particularly for low-income um, families. I don't think that um, the department or Congress have focused enough on things like asset building. Um, UNCF is running a, um, a small pilot with the KIPP charter schools uh, to help low-income students and families uh, build college savings accounts. Um, pretty interesting initiative. We've got about 8,000 students enrolled now. Uh, we've been going at this for almost four years. Uh, and it's built around financial literacy and some, some other things. Um, and, uh, you know, I think asset building is one thing that we need to think about, not only in terms of helping them build the financial resources for college, uh, but we're also seeing some uh, very positive effects uh, just in terms of um, under these, helping these kids understand what it takes to be ac academically prepared for college, uh, to have sort of a college-going culture in those families, you know, and really to get those, those kids into college and to persist in college. Uh, so I think we're going to need to be creative to look at some other um, policy initiatives as well, not just fully looking at, fully looking at uh, student loan and, and Pell Grants, but what else what else can we do, uh, you know, to help these, um, these kids get to the finish line? Eliminating plus in isolation is, is, I think, dangerous because it's one more step of big brother federal government deciding who's going to go to school and where they're going to go. I mean, the, the reality is, we, and I'm a big fan of community colleges. Anybody who knows my legislative history knows that. But to suggest there's a lot of access and opportunity in the community college system in America today is to be ignorant of the reality. I mean, they don't have the support. They don't have the ability to enroll a number of students. And you, I mean, 70% of the students who enroll as adults in our schools, 70% have had a different college experience that didn't work for them. So let's, let's recognize that in today's diverse population, and diverse workplace, we have to recognize and empower the diversity of our post-secondary delivery system. I appreciate that, that you mentioned how two-year schools sometimes have difficulty in supporting students because of an argument mm -hmm. that we hear a lot in my region of the country. Um, I, my counter argument to that would be though, who would be there to support the student after they took on the education debt in order to attend your institutions? So. It's it's kind of a you well, can look see, at it both perspectives. We're, 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 I'm happy to say yeah, that my yeah. organization, as a debt management organization, fits that bill and helps people once they've already borrowed figure out how to manage their repayment. But you're you're talking about you're saying that community colleges don't support students and therefore you know that's not a solution for students who may not be able to afford other types of institutions. But where is the support for after the debt is already incurred? Don't look at inputs as the final decision maker here. It needs to be outcomes. It needs to be accountability in those outcomes. If you will look at our proposal for reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, we suggest that every school ought to have a risk-based metric on retention, graduation, placement, earnings gain, all of those issues. 
So what we are. And if they don't doing, meet those goals, is their ability? Yeah, to I mean, what you do is what, what, what you that? do is you look at the schools and you say, look, <clears throat> we're not going to penalize your school because you are serving low-income students and you take a higher percent of Pell Grants or plus loans or whatever else it is. But what we are going to do is we're going to say to you as a school, we're going to judge you on retention. We're going to judge you on graduation. We're going to judge you on placement in your field of interest. We're going to judge you on lifetime or even 10-year earnings gains. I mean, we're willing to hold our schools and every other school in America on an appropriate risk-based metrics for accountability and outcomes. But don't judge our schools with the Princetons and the Harvards of the world. We attract different students, Absolutely. different economic environments. Absolutely. We're never going to compare with them. And if that's going to be the standard, we're going to deny access to a whole percent of America's But people. again, let's people. define access. What is access? Is access just getting in? Or is no, it complete? I, I just got done telling you, man. Access ought not just be entrance. It okay. ought to be outcome. I concur. We're, we're there. We're there. We're there. All right. But don't hold us responsible or indict us because we serve a constituency that is low income and at risk for starters. It's not an indictment. It's just, it's, it's, I, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not indicting your institutions at all. It's, 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 it's more a reflection of, are you aware of the implications of your policy? I think a lot of times, yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times with policy, it's like we have what we design. Can we all agree that we there are unintended consequences of policy, right? Sure. And there's no one policy that can help everybody. I mean, you, you create the policy with the intent of helping. It's utilitarian principle, right? John Stuart Mill, helping the maximum amount of people as possible. There will always be people who fall through the cracks. Fine. That's we can accept that, right? We can't accept that, but that's just the reality of life, right? Sure. Okay. Are we good on that? So if that's the case. And, and students are not able to continue and be retained because they can't afford to continue because perhaps they bit off more than they could chew to begin with, and they're not completing because their financial constraints. And once they leave, if they successfully complete the program, they're in a, uh, a challenging state of affairs with regards to what their income is and their ability to repay. Like, are you, is your is your mission? Are you really achieving what you're what you're go, what you're setting out to do? To, and, to take a look at the data, Kevin. In in, in two year programs. My schools have the best graduation rate of any two-year programs delivered by any sector of higher education today. Now, what we ought to do, and we've seen this with the MOOCs, we ought to ask real questions of whether or not we need some kind of different criteria for all of our online programs because they have the poorest completion rates. Okay. So we ought to look at that, or we ought to look at some other delivery system and ask those kind of questions if we want. But I think we have to be really careful here in terms of automatically saying one size fits all in terms of the students we serve or the pedagogy of the delivery of our education. Right, and, and I would argue that when you're talking about, because completion rates are, are, are a point that's brought up frequently, if you go to a two-year school and you're Pell eligible and you have no out-of-pocket costs, if you don't complete, the financial consequences are not the same as if you go to Morehouse and take out a $30,000 plus loan and you find that in the middle of that, you're not able to sustain that those costs, but and now you're saddled with that debt yeah, and yeah. Of inability to repay. But but you know when, when is it next week? The White House is holding this seminar to get traditional liberal arts schools to reach out to attract and enroll more minority students and low income students and all that. And and my membership says, Steve, why aren't you there? Why aren't you? Why aren't we invited to this? And I said, relax. I said, this isn't about us. I mean, there is an important conversation in America today that suggests that we ought to diversify liberal arts education in this country in ways that we have not yet done. But that's not my mission at my schools. The mission of my schools is, for the most part, post-secondary career education. And so I don't belong at that conversation in the White House a week from now. I hope it works. I'll support it. But I don't need to have a seat at that table. We need to recognize this diversity of post-secondary education. We were really far afield from plus loans, although that was really interesting. Um, so we, I want to do, I think I'll do one more question and then we'll do audience questions. So start start thinking of your questions. Um, I'm interested in this idea of loan limits and, and institutional loan <coughs> limits as well as federal loan limits. And Steve, I know this is something your institutions have said is that they wish they could limit overborrowing from students um, or, or what they see as maybe overborrowing from students um, or, or borrowing for living expenses and online programs um, or things like that. 
I'm wondering, um, Rachel, if you think that would be something that could be a solution to some of the issues you see in the PLUS programs, um, and whether the rest of you think that this is a wise idea or whether this should be a broader criteria for loans as a whole, rather than leaving it up to um, financial aid administrators. Right, and, and one of my smaller recommendations that schools can adopt right now is that schools don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have any flexibility basically for the Stafford loan program. They have to give students the full amount that they're entitled to, but it's not the same for the PLUS loan program. PLUS loans don't have to be in a financial aid award package. Um, in fact, the Department of Education has a uh, let, uh, financial aid award letter um, that they are encouraging students to use called the financial aid shopping sheet and on there plus loans are only mentioned as an additional resource that students should contact their financial aid offices for um, so I think uh, we uh, Cheryl talked about financial literacy um, of, of parents and students and I, I think especially with first generation college goers um, you see what the cost of attendance is and then maybe you see a plus loan soaking up that full cost of attendance and you think wow this is how much it costs to go to college and I have no other choice but to borrow this loan. Now, if you take the loan out of the package, it, pu it pushes the family to hit pause and to contact the financial aid office and to really think about uh, whether or not they're going to be able to afford that education, not for it to just be immediately available to them. Um, but in addition to that, and just taking out of the financial aid award packages, I think would be a very helpful first step that institutions should already be doing. Um, I, I think uh, capping the loans is, is a smart idea. Um, and it was one of my recommendations in the choose your own adventure sort of recommendation. You could cap it to what we uh, give independent students. So independent students, you're either dependent or independent for financial aid purposes. And usually, if you're above the age of 24, that's the easiest check. Um, you're considered independent. And so uh, you get extra student loans um, because you're, you don't, the, the thought there is that you don't have a family to help support you. So, so maybe uh, we cap the student loans at the extra four or five the plus loans at an extra four or $5,000 what the independent students would be getting. Or you could cap them, for example, at expected family contribution, um, which is the, the federal financial aid uh, equation is very wonky, um, but basically once a student fills out uh, the FAFSA, um, that's how it gives them an expected family contribution, and, and that could be anything um, from zero to three thousand. So you know, to anything above that. So for example, if it was zero, you wouldn't be able to let, uh, to to borrow any more money. If it was three thousand dollars, your family would have access to three thousand dollars of loans. Um, so doing something like that. I think we have to be very careful about loan limits and capping loan limits, and. Um, uh, um, do some careful analysis as to what that means for low-income student access. Um, I do think that um, giving institutions some additional flexibility um, uh, on a um, that goes be, that goes beyond. Right now, on uh, schools do have ability on a student by student basis to adjust uh, aid packages. Uh, and to uh, limit borrowing, but it must be on an individual by individual basis. They can't, for example, kind of develop an object, uh, objective criteria that apply to everybody. Um, I do think it's, it would be worthwhile looking at giving institutions some broader flexibility um, to look at borrowing, because um, their institutions are closest to the students. Um, I'm not certain that I've seen good information that suggests the extent to which excessive borrowing is um, a real problem. Um, certainly we hear um, anecdotes, um, but I do think this is something worth looking into. Steve, that's on. I mean, I mean we, we have said that we support the ability of primarily of the school to cap loans. This loan, any other loan, I think we can start with that. I also think, though, that you know, if, if we're serious about access and financial integrity, accountability, same time, then I think, I think we also ought to ask the question of, A, should there be some kind of income-based repayment program for PLUS loans as well, or B, should we get to that proposal which says that you can come up to this cap, but if you're going to go beyond that cap, whatever that cap is, then maybe you need a co-signer so that there's one more step of transparency and understanding of exactly what it is you're taking on. So, I mean, there are different options to dealing with that issue. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thanks for the question. I think that the 
the evidence would suggest that the, a cap on plus uh, would be reasonable. Um, part of doing that would be to get more data on plus, which we all agree. I think we can all agree that that's something that uh, would be necessary going forward. So if you had data on plus, and Cheryl mentioned that there's not much, well, there may not be much data on what constitutes excessive borrowing. Um, I mean, that's a subjective term. If you, if a parent, so let's take a hypothetical situation. If a parent borrowed $80,000 cumulative and plus, so they borrowed $20,000 a year, presuming their son or daughter was on the four-year plan, um, and they have an income of $50,000, then on a repayment, to repay that monthly, it would be roughly 23% of their income. And if you push that out to a 30-year repayment plan, it would be probably around 16%. Now, the general rule is that 15% of your income in making a repayment is a tough stretch, regardless of your income. And then if we can say, regardless of your income, we could probably say that that's, if you're low income or middle income, it's probably more difficult. So if you just took, if you took those numbers and we were able to get a larger data set, then we could come to hopefully an agreement about what is, what would be excessive borrowing or what is responsible borrowing and what is, what is, what is realistic to repay. Income-based is a, is a reasonable solution and I, and I would argue that every, all ideas should be on the table. However, the distinction in income-based is when you have, again, when you have a parent, their income ladder or income earnings potential is not the same as a 22-year-old who just finished college and will probably working until he or she is 60 or 65. In fact, maybe even longer. So it, it, it might be a temporary solution, um, but maybe a long-term solution uh, uh, would probably work a little bit better in that instance. I'm going to go ahead and get started with questions um, in a minute. I'm shocked that a panel has decided that we need more data and that we should address things in a holistic way in reauthorization. I have <laughs> never heard such a conclusion before. Um, but I, I've seen lots of talk on Twitter, so I assume there's some questions in the audience. Um, do we have a microphone going around? Perfect. Surprise. Um, <laughs> David Bergeron, now at the Center for American Progress, and since Steve said that, that I should have been up there instead of him, I, I figure I, I should say a couple things and then ask uh, Rachel a question. A um, couple things about what we know about PLUS loans. Remember that until uh, ECASL, Insuring uh, Student Loan Access Act, um, PLUS loans went into repayment immediately, as soon as they were fully dispersed. Since ECASL, those loans uh, only go into repayment when the student graduates, when they finish or leave higher education. And so any data the department had on repayment histories and default rates, forget it. It's useless, meaningless, irrelevant to the current state because a CASLA uh, changed that. So you just keep that in mind um, when, you, when you call for data is the data are what the program was historically, not what the program is today, and the program has changed change fundamentally. Second thing is I agree with everything the panel has said about you can't deal with this issue in isolation and, and that we need to do more with, in terms of increasing grant support. And I would just assert that the $41 billion in profit that Steve referenced is being used to pay for Pell Grants today. That's where that money goes. It doesn't go to Arnie and goes to his destra. And, you know, I'm not saying that to defend my former boss, just to make the point that this is a um, this is a, a long-standing problem. We've, we've decided that we're, we're going to disinvest in higher education as a nation, and it, we've done it at our peril, and it's harmed our students. And so, you know, when I, uh, so my question to you, to you, Rachel, is, you know, if, if we were really going to deal with this whole system holistically, and we were going to say, okay, what, what, what would be an appropriate way to replace plus loans? Not, for upper income and middle income students with, um, with uh, uh, you know, a, a grant aid, but for low income students, where should we be thinking about the, the, for low income students the, the, the amount of grant support we're providing to replace what's currently going into PLUS on? 
So this gets more into the realm of reauthorization in a very hopeful <laughs> way that we would have a really wonderful reauthorization. Um, but I think I think the the main and, and I, I agree with Steve. I really do agree with a, a simplified, you know, one loan, take the parents out of the picture, one grant system, um, and and we know grants are better targeted. So so trying to figure out how to increase the Pell Grant is always going to be an issue. But I think the real issue at large, um, um, and again, this is speaking very hypothetically, of course, is that th the major issue of college costs going up has been state disinvestment. So how do we ensure that states get skin back in the game is, is really the biggest question mark right now. And, and you know, historically, there have been a lot, there has been a partnership between the federal government and state and states to invest in their uh, higher education institution and and that has eroded in time um, and, and so I think back to um, one of my favorite acts because I went to a state school um, so the moral land grant act uh, and that was a federal state partnership there to ensure that there were universities that existed um, that state universities that were affordable for students that provided access um, so we really need to get back to this federal state partnership so yes we need to increase grants but we also need to really tackle this affordability conversation and really get at what is one of what is the biggest cost driver of higher education and it is disinvestment 70 percent of students go to public colleges and universities and we really need to to get at that issue so i'm um, uh, zakia smith lumina foundation um and um, really appreciate the conversation thus far. I would actually um, like to follow up on what Rachel just said and go back to the affordability question because so much of this conversation is really about whether college is affordable or not for students. And whatever you think about the, the type of institution or what have you, we all seem to agree that we want more students to go to college and complete and that's a good thing for our economy. Um, so but with respect to what Rachel just said, I would argue that that's really irrelevant, the state disinvestment for the people that are on this panel, right? We've got private HBCUs and we've got pri <laughs> private sector colleges and universities who do not receive any state money. So the question then, which I know Kevin always brings up when we talk about this state disinvestment is, what's going on there, right? Like, We've got you know, tuition continuing to go up on that side um, and it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with what states are doing um, by and large. So we've got an affordability problem that's, that's larger than, um, than just what's happening at the states that we've got to grapple with, particularly in private colleges and universities. One way that we've been able to kind of stave off the immediate issue is to have loans for students to take out um, and now loans for their, their parents to take out. Um, and I guess, so one question is, you know, what do we do about affordability if we're just kind of moving toward loans to kind of help with the increase in college costs on, on the private side? Um, and is there um, a connection that I, uh, this is kind of a controversial question that I was thinking before you, you started this, um, Rachel, but the conversation about private loans, right? We've kind of tried to move people away from private loans, but plus loans to parents who do not have um, one of the most, Interesting things that was said this whole time or that's probably in your report is that we give loans to parents who we've determined don't have any ability to repay. And to David's point, so we've said that the parent has a zero EFC, which means right now, today, we do not think that they can give one dollar to pay for their students' higher education. But then we go back around and give them potentially unlimited amounts and up until recently they were required to start paying on those um, almost immediately. And so I'm having a difficult time reconciling that in my head and it, you, know, you don't want to restrict access to, I love Morehouse College, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, I think you know, every black male in America should go there um, and, and become a Morehouse man. But I'm, you know, I'm kind of conflicted in how do you deal with the fact that the price is escalating. So that's kind of my broad question. You talk about, um, we talked about this being a broader problem. So outside of the state piece, what do we do about the college affordability problem? And I know we've talked about increased grant aid. It like irks me to no end because while I was in the Obama administration, we increased Pell Grants from $16 billion to almost $40 billion. So that was a pretty large investment in grant aid. And I know the individual Pell Grant um, on average has not necessarily kept up, but that was a pretty large investment. So is that the answer? More, more dollars to Pell Grants, $100 billion to Pell Grants, you know, a trillion dollars for Pell Grants, or is there something else that we can do to, to address the affordability issue? We have half an hour. We can we can solve this, right? <laughs> um, just can I um, speak to that just just briefly? Um, I was the clerk of the Labor HHS Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, uh, and so I spent um, many days, weeks, hours, and months grappling with Pell grants. 
uh, and how to help Congress raise that maximum grant. Um, and I, I, I think it's possible to do more there. Uh, you know, we, we have to get Pell Grants on a, um, a financially uh, sustainable path, but I don't think we should just, you know, um, put up our hands and say we can't do more. Uh, and I think we have to look at um, are there other things that we can do in the financial system overall, the financial aid programs overall, to redirect more aid to low-income students. Um, and also, and I think the Obama administration is very focused on this, um, how do we get uh, students and low-income students in particular to finish college faster? Meaning four years instead of six years or, or longer. You know, and that will entail things like, you know, hopefully we can get summer Pell Grants back you know, so that there can be uh, year-round support, uh, acceleration of their, their programs. Um, you know, and it, as you know, there's a lot of innovation that's going on right now to look at how we can increase time to degree, uh, because that will help make college more affordable for students as well. So, I mean, it's a pretty complicated picture, uh, but, you know, we've got to look at these things the things that we can do within the financial aid programs, but also how can we incent, um, you know, institutions to focus on, um, you know, making sure that students have a clear path uh, so that, that they can get their degree on time, that they're not wasting time taking courses that uh, don't help get them there, um, and what else can we do within the higher ed system, you know, to increase time to to, to, to degree. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, when Mitch Daniels became the uh, president of Purdue, I sent him an email and I said, welcome to the revolution in higher education. I think everything is changing about who we teach, where we teach, how we teach, etc. But I have to say that I don't think that same revolution in terms of how we finance post-secondary education is, has occurred. And I think we need to, and I'm just give you one data point. Most of you know I was at the Council on Foundations before I came over here. Um, Boston College study on social welfare, intergenerational transfer of wealth said we're going to have a $40 trillion transfer of wealth in the next 50 years. I had two years ago when I was at the Council, I had Missouri uh, <coughs> uh, do an update of that study after the recession. You know what they said? The intergenerational transfer of wealth isn't $40 trillion anymore. It's $74 trillion. We can't be looking at this, as Rachel and Kevin both said, as just a public sector financed post-secondary system. It has to be a public-private philanthropic partnership, and that takes a real step back and some creative thinking about how we design and deliver it. Thanks. I'll be brief as well. Um, in my opinion, as I appreciate all the policy that will be turned through over the next few years, um, any sort of change with regards to affordability or higher education is going to come from the outside. Um, it'll be consumer driven. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily believe that the Thiel Fellows will be, you know, expanded from 20 to 200,000. And for those of you that don't know, Field Fellows, the inventor of PayPal, gives people $100,000, I believe, not to go to college and to work on your invention. That's not going to be large scale. Or Anya Kamenetz, author of Generation Debt and Do-It-Yourself Education, is very um, you know, keen on you know, do-it-yourself school and edupreneurs, she calls them. I don't necessarily think that that's going to be uh, the revolution. Uh, it'll be looking at alternate ways of credentialing because are we are we and it, it'll get back to the debate what we had in grad school to key and I about is college a is it a signal to a potential employer about your skills and capabilities or is it a credential particularly if you're doing going to a skills based program where there actually is a trade that you're learning right <coughs> and so you'll start to see some more differentiation in the models of higher ed and to address that question and at the same time you'll also see uh, I, I believe alternate forms of credentialing that will call into question is this, you know, eighty or ninety thousand dollar investment for a particular private school worth the return that I'll be getting, and so it, you know, it will be market driven. There are policies that can be undertaken uh, to 
ameliorate the condition right now because the horses left the barn on how we fund education in this country. So it's not, the shift isn't going to go back to more grants versus less loans. Like it is what it is right now. Um, you know, I saw in your notes, we, you know, you recommend maybe adopting an Australian model of repayment, Canadian model of repayment, um, and perhaps those could be some solutions that are explored down the road. Um, but it's if we if we bring it if we talk about what's in the best interest of the borrowers and educating them, uh, you know, hopefully that leads to uh, some market correction with regard to the costs and people making different choices based on um, being financially literate and potentially wise borrowers. Um, so yeah, of course I talked about the seventy percent of students, but it's also important to remember that thirty percent of millions of students is you know very important too um, and and those 30 percent of students are going to institutions that typically have high net prices um, and and I think these institutions are at a point where they're really going to have to to innovate and figure out how to contain and, and rein in costs along with us coming up with solutions um, with you know trying to increase the Pell Grant which is pretty much a, a non-starter right now um, yes I would love that but I mean still we couldn't give a Pell Grant that would be large enough to cover the high net prices at these institutions so what can the institutions do um, and what should they be doing given that you know the cost of college in the in the nonprofit and, and private sector is, is been raising faster than that rate of inflation in, in, in many instances and um, yet wages have remained uh, stagnant so um, there are pockets of innovation going on at institutions um, around the country at, at, at nonprofit and private institutions flexible degree pathways I mean but these need to be at scale and the most important thing is that the cost savings that come with this can't be uh, need to be passed on to the student because not always are they passed on to this student. Um, we've just figured out better ways to get them through faster, um, uh, and we've figured out how to lower costs. But because of the cross subsidy involved, oftentimes these co these cost savers are not passed on to students. So figuring out sort of a way to pass savings on to students um, and, and coming up with a, a wholesale answer to the affordability question that doesn't just focus on state government and federal government, but also focuses on the institutions themselves. Hi, Jonathan Palmer with Medill News Service. Um, this is actually directed for Care. Uh, Carol Smith, my bad, Carol Smith. Um, I was wondering, you, men <laughs> you, you mentioned a I'll couple answer. times that you were wary of the capping on the PLUS loans. I want to understand uh, what was your wariness on cap, putting a cap on the PLUS loans. Well, PLUS loans do help uh, low-income students finance, with their parents, finance uh, total cost of attendance. And there are, there are low-income students who need that extra that need that extra help. Uh, so I think just before committing to, you know, radically changing the program, we need to understand what the impact of that change would be. Uh, and if that change were made, it need, would need to be made in concert uh, in all likelihood with um, other changes like raising the, the limits on Stafford loans, which go directly to, to students. By the way, I'm a middle grad, go Cats. <laughs> Um, uh, when Ben Miller gave his introduction and um, explanation of the uh, the program, oh, he uh, mentioned your name, that, please, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, Maureen Bedetti at Naiku. Thank you. Um, he, he said that there were two explanations that um, had surfaced about the immediate problem that the this was supposed to be about, which seems to have drifted a bit. But um, uh, and the one thing that you have been talking about um, has been the issue of. If, if I could, you know, kind of say it uh, in a shorthand, the overborrowing. But um, what hasn't been um, discussed much is the the change in the um, the from the felt program to the direct loan program. And um, I just wondered what it was that you were um, alluding to with that, and if you could give us a little more information about why you thought that was a um, an explanation for the the change in the plus um, acceptance rate. Oh, ben, you want to come up here? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So the basic idea is that um, the lenders in the FEL program had their own discretion 
for how to do the adverse credit history. They had to look at everything in the regulations, but they had the ability to look at some additional factors if they wanted to or not. And the general understanding is that it was common practice in the FELL program to include those additional factors as part of what they looked at to determine whether or not a loan was 90, 90 or more days delinquent because they, in their minds they thought that something that had flipped into collections or been charged off had already hit 90 days delinquency and it just wasn't measured in a time-based delinquency anymore. So that, that was just sort of their common practice in trying to make sure that, you know, that the banks that had been operating as banks sort of to sort of take their lead from what they were doing. Could I add a little more color to that? Um, so as, <coughs> as, as I understand it, so before the banks were taken out of, uh, out of the, the uh, Stafford Loan Program as the, the middleman, uh, part of the PLUS loan portfolio was, was issued by private banks under the FELL program, and part of the program was issued by the Department of Education. Uh, and as Ben said, um, the, uh, the banks were allowed under the program to implement more restrictive lending criteria. When the department uh, essentially assumed responsibility for the entire program, you know, my understanding based on conversations with Department of Education folks uh, is that uh, they internally then made the decision that they wanted to use the more restrictive criteria uh, that, um, that had existed in the FELL program. So uh, we think that there was a choice uh, and the department decided to go with more restrictive lending criteria. And, and that, of course, is kind of what set off you know, this crisis, at least within the HBCU uh, community. Um, but that this was a very substantial change, even though the regulations didn't change. Uh, and that, that is why we think this was a, uh, a flawed process procedurally, you know, that the department before doing that major change should have, at that point, uh, gone through a rulemaking process. Hi, uh, Shelley Rep from NCHAIR here. I mean, a couple of people on the panel talked about the intergenerational aspect of this. We don't have one loan. We have two loans here, a plus loan, a parent loan. A uh, parent taking out a loan, plus or minus a few years, might be 40 years old. Um, with a 20-year, 30-year, you know, Kevin talked about repayment plan, they're going to be paying this loan off when they're, potentially, when they're 70. Uh, and no longer working, um, and all they have is Social Security, and as I think we know, Social Security can be docked um, in part to pay off your student loans. I guess my question is, particularly if PLUS is packaged, do people really know, uh, do parents know uh, what they're getting into? Um, I know some parents sort of think that their kids are going to take over their payment of their loan, but I don't know if that happens or not. But the legal liability is on the parents' part. Uh, I guess my question is, you know, really do, do people have, and I know Cheryl talked about financial literacy, but do people real, is there really, do, are parents entering, parents entering into these loans with their, with their eyes wide open? And one other comment I just have to say, say is that we've talked about here about the government making $40 billion on their student loans a year, and I just need to say that there's at least a legitimate question about whether or not the, the government really is making loans, uh, making money on their student loans. But to go back to my main question. Kevin, I'll let you start with that as somebody who's closest to the borrowers themselves. Sure. Thanks for your question. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, the parents in my experience over the past uh, 12 years, um, prior to ASA, I was actually in admissions and financial aid at a private institution in New England, um, are not aware of what the implications are of a PLUS loan. Um, when it's included in the financial aid award, oftentimes what will happen at the bottom is the balance will be zero. So it will say, you know, Pell Grant is X, Stafford loan is this, federal plus loan is this, and then parent and student responsibility will be zero. Now, if you're a parent and you're looking at a financial aid award letter, and one of the things to keep in mind is that for the, for the majority of these people, this is the first time they've ever paid for school. 
When you go to public school, you pay taxes and your kid goes to school. Unless you enroll them in a parochial or private, other, other private institution, this is the first time you're ever paying for school. This is a foreign concept to you. So even if you are aware of grants and loans and what the terminology is, which again, <coughs> many of them aren't, and part of the issue is in the financial aid, or in, the finan in the higher education financing community or higher ed in general, when you're used to de dealing with these acronyms, you're assuming a level of sophistication on the other side that just doesn't exist. It's almost like asking a fish what water is or how does it feel to be wet. Like a fish swims in water all the time, so like what do you mean? What does it mean to be wet? Like, um, you know, it's just a foreign concept. So when parent and student responsibility says zero, the idea is, okay, well, then I don't pay anything out of pocket. I bring nothing to the table. And it's only after that first bill becomes due is it like, oh, well, okay, well, I'll pay it for now, and then my son or daughter will assume it, and that, that's not the case. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do in our community engagement is uh, by operating a college planning center in conjunction with uh, federal education opportunity centers is to really get information to people before they undertake these loans so that they understand what will happen down the road, you know, what is their debt to income ratio currently, um, what are their options going forward. Um, and the other thing that, that's very interesting is that in liaising with a lot of the schools, guidance counselors themselves, there's a level of misunderstanding and misconceptions among school professionals that is astounding, unfortunately. Um, so the, peop the very same people that we would look to to support our efforts in increasing financial literacy among students and families are unfamiliar with this territory themselves. Uh, and unfortunately, if they are familiar with it, oftentimes the, the, what I'll hear is that, well, this is a sensitive topic. I don't feel comfortable, even though I have the knowledge to talk about these issues, talk about financial aid and affordability, I don't feel that it's my place as a student's academic guidance counselor to tell them whether or not they can or can't afford this institution. So the onus is entirely on the family to make that decision. And as we discussed before, this is an emotional decision, right? This is an emotional process. This is not thinking purely with your head, it's thinking with your heart, particularly if you're low income and first generation. And the, 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 what we've attempted to do is encourage families from all walks of life, from all um, income levels, is to have the conversations, as difficult as they may be, the earlier you have them, about what's, what, what our family can afford, because it is, it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. Right? The definition of affordability is different depending on where you sit. So when we talk about that, it's, 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 we also talk about it's not what the college costs, it's what that college costs you. So somebody going to a $50,000 school, somebody's going to pay $40,000, somebody's going to pay five, dollars and everywhere else in between. So the idea is to, is to bring a lot of, to distill a lot of this complex information into digestible portions, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy lift because there's so much information, it's, it's, and there's so many opportunities to get it to the families, but uh, in the end, as Rachel mentioned from the Chronicle article today, even if people are facing uh, potential financial difficulties in the future, they'll still go ahead with it because they so want their student to succeed and not really understanding what the implications of that decision will be. I do think this is an area that we don't um, handle particularly well. You know, when I, um, you know, talk to my mom who's trying to figure out uh, her health insurance options. Uh, you know, she can go to um, a, uh, a center under that I think is funded under the, um, Ameri the uh, Older Americans Act, you know, and get face-to-face -face help, someone to help her navigate through all of these different plans and costs, et cetera. Um, you know, and I, th I think we need something like that in higher education. We actually have something like that with the TRIO <coughs> programs, uh, but, you know, they're only able to um, handle so much. And we haven't really invested in those kinds of, of programs. So I think it, it, that's another to-do item, to really think about how do we help students and families navigate. Uh, you know, I think it's just... Um, not sufficient to, you know, uh, maybe for the new generation to have, you know, the, the interaction with the internet uh, and uh, the tools that are on the internet. But for, you know, a sizable proportion of our students and our parents, you know, I think we do, they do need that face-to-face -face, uh, personal kind of counseling. 
uh, you know, that we are pro that is provided in a lot of other sort of non-education programs. And I think that navigation, personal navigator concept, you know, is one that we should think about expanding here. I think we'll take one last question. Hi, um, <coughs> Jason Delal, New America Foundation. So uh, I've, I've heard from uh, sort of a general theme here that parents and borrowers need better consumer information and presumably then they could make the choice on whether or not they should take out a Parent PLUS loan. Do institutions of higher education, the ones that you represent, uh, have a conflict of interest in providing that advice and should they even be allowed to? Uh, well, that's a good question. I think uh, certainly institutions should be providing um, you know, some, uh, and I think they're required to at least uh, under, uh, for, the, for staff rent loans, providing uh, some, um, some counseling. Uh, I, don't, I think by no means they should, they should not be the only ones doing that. Uh, there should be, cert there should be um, other independent um, nonprofits, other entities, other sources that parents and students can go to to get solid, uh, impartial, uh, advice and counseling. Uh, my, my sector schools are obviously very sensitive on this whole issue because we've been often accused of misrepresentation. So our sector has developed a whole set of best practices on, it, on recruitment and admissions. And obviously one of those issues is that the admissions and the financial aid conversations have got to be separate. Um, our schools have developed some pretty rigorous standards to the point of Many of our schools literally have a, a recording of everything that admissions counselor says um, so that they have it on tape and they obviously have gone to the point of signing um, acknowledgments so that the student and or the parents, usually the student, but, I mean, so there's no question about what was said, what was not said, what the arrangement is because we've got to make sure that when we talk about transparency, it is transparency that's also understood. Well, I want to thank um, everyone on the panel. This has been a wonderful and wide-ranging discussion. Um, and I, I appreciate your time and, and Rachel for organizing this and inviting me to moderate. It's been a lot of fun.